Hello and welcome to my video. Um, this video is uh, in my usual style, which is exactly the same as the last video I put up. And on that subject, I'd just like to say thank you to all the people who have uh, viewed my video and uh, left comments and uh, asked questions. I read all comments and any questions I will answer. Doesn't matter what you ask me, I'll answer it to the best of my ability. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. And um, I, I uh, would just like to say uh, also um, the response to my last video has been quite staggering. It's, uh, I think it's only been uploaded for just over three days and already it's um, hit 40,385 views, which is very unusual for me. I usually get 5,000 maybe over six months, so um, I'm slightly uh, shocked. So if you do like this one, please hit the thumbs up sign and subscribe. And if you'd like to see more of my work, go over to Facebook, Stuart Davis Artist, and perhaps like that as well. Anything else I was going to say, I'm going to put down in the uh, box down there. And um, there we are. Let's get on with the painting. See you later. Bye. Here we go then. Right, so this is, um, for some reason, it looks green, but it isn't. It's um, Payne's Grey with a little bit of blue in it. And uh, it's just one of the ways that I like to start a painting, and that's to sort of... Um, just make marks just to see a, sort of what's going to come out of my imagination. Uh, and I should say at this point that this place doesn't exist. It's purely imaginary. Um, it's just uh, it's just a sort of landscape that I've probably seen at some time and uh, it's got stuck in my, uh, in my memory. I'm quite fortunate in that um, I have a slightly uh, what's called eidetic memory and uh, I'll just explain what that means. Um, I, I can be driving along in my car and I can see a view that I like. I just get out of my car and I stand there for a few minutes and just stare at the landscape. And I find that I can store this in my, uh, in my memory and then recreate it uh, at my leisure. It's very useful. I never actually work from photographs. I do, have, I do take photographs of uh, close-ups of bits of foliage so that I fully understand how the lights and the darks work. But usually, um, you know, well, not usually. I, I just don't have any visual reference in front of me when I'm painting. It's totally from my mind. And uh, just as a, a little aside, I, I don't know whether other painters experience this, but prior to starting a painting, I, I have this like surge of energy that uh, I can feel welling up inside me. And it tends to come out in the painting as very explosive movements when I'm when I'm actually starting to apply the paint. I don't I don't tickle the canvas at all. I don't basically I don't pussyfoot around. I just sort of dive into it and make as many dramatic marks and shapes that I can. So uh, that that sort of may give you a little insight in the sort of frame of mind that I'm in when I'm painting a picture. Um, you can probably see by now, even at this stage, that uh, the lights and the darks th uh, that I'm putting down actually start to turn into a landscape quite early on. Now, this may sound silly. It's obviously a landscape. But um, it, it, it just seems to automatically give perspective to the picture and a certain dynamic look because you need contrast for uh, dramatic scenes. So that's what I'm creating. So if I, if I make a shape, I will make sure that it's, it's a definite shape with strong defining lines. And that way you, um, you sort of, you, 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 you express the dynamic look that you want in a painting. This may, it probably sounds silly, but uh, it's just the way I feel when I'm painting. I like, I like to um, just chuck the paint on the board or canvas sometimes, although I don't use canvas much now, but uh, I just like to sort of really get into it quickly. This, the effect this has 
um, on me is that it, it gives a feeling of well-being early on in the picture. And I think this is important when you're painting. If you, if you start a picture and you just start with a, a series of errors, it's going to make you feel as though you can't paint and there's no, there's no chance of you ever being able to paint. And You've got to sort of get past that. Just be bold. Make bold statements. Uh, basically go for it and uh, you'll, you'll see that um, with a bit of practice you will start to feel as though you're actually accomplishing something early on and that once you get in that frame of mind that will stay with you obviously it takes practice to do this sort of thing it's not not something you can do overnight um, I was trained uh, to paint in the classical style and early in my career I used to copy old masters for a living, particularly Dutch uh, paintings. I really like Dutch seascapes and uh, I, I think I've got a photograph or two around um, which I will, uh, well actually are on my Facebook page. Maybe I'll uh, make up a, a video in the future with uh, just a series of paintings that I've done. And there's a there's one painting which I was asked to copy many times, and I think it's 24 times, and that's The Girl with the Pearl Earring by Vermeer. And uh, I, do have, um, I do have a painting of that, so I'll, um, I will show that to you in the near future. So here, at this stage, it looks like I've already established the horizon line. I haven't really, I'm just, um, I'm just playing at the moment. Um, I will be probably adding uh, a mountain, um, any, anything to prevent the horizon just being flat. I like, I like it to sort of, uh, I, like the, I like to give the eye something to travel over. So here we are on the sky. Um, this is something I do often. I will have a, a dark sky either on the left or right and a light sky on the opposite side. Uh, it's just something I do, and um, maybe it's uh, uh, something I need to change, but it's, uh, I just like that look. I think it's, uh, it shows the, the battle between light and darkness, and obviously the light will always win. Well, one hopes it will. So, now I'm working on this with a, a bit of kitchen paper, just to sort of break down the um, brush strokes a little bit. And of course, the kitchen paper that I use uh, is quite a quite an industrial uh, type. It's very strong. It'll take a lot of punishment before it starts to fall apart. And if you do this method, um, try to use try to use a paper that uh, doesn't have too much of a pattern on it. The flatter the surface, the better. So over on the left hand side, this is Payne's grey with a lot of oil in it. And it will end up lighter later, but uh, I'm just sort of, I, you know, I'm experimenting. Basically, I'm having fun. You notice the, uh, <laughs> you notice the board is wobbling all over the place. It's, um, I, I have a, a very good, uh, I think it's a French easel. Uh, it'll take an enormous um, canvas. Uh, this one is 50, I think 51 inches wide. And the depth is probably, I don't know, 30, so maybe more inches, something like that. And the oil that I'm using is not, uh, it's not the standard linseed oil that you would buy in an art shop. Uh, it's got a slight yellow tinge to it, which doesn't affect the paint in any way at all. And it's actually the oil that uh, you... Um, would use to put on your wooden breadboard to seal it. So it's already got a, in France, they call it a sicative, uh, which is a drying agent added to it. So uh, around, I don't know, 15, 16 hours after you paint like this, uh, it becomes touch dry and you can add another layer uh, over the top without any uh, problems about cracking Obviously, if you 
oil paint. Well, maybe you won't know. If you're just starting, you won't know this. Um, there's the th- lean over fat method, which is worth knowing. If you paint quite thick paint um, and you don't wait long enough for it to dry and then put paint over the top, it will crack because they're drying at different rates and uh, the top surface will crack. The way I overcome this is I use my paint quite thinly, uh, so it's thin on thin really, and I do the second thin coat after the first thin coat is reasonably touch dry, so it doesn't crack at all. Now, at this stage, I've started to establish a few things in the picture. It's it's still flexible. Uh, it'll be flexible right up until the point when I finish the painting. But I'm, I, I like the idea of this clump of trees over there. You'll notice that I'm using uh, all sides of the brush. If you use the brush flat on the canvas, mainly the tip, you will get solid coverage. When you drag the brush sideways, uh, basically with the uh, usually with the bristles pointing towards the ceiling, um, you will push the paint away, and that will show the gesso uh, underneath coming through, and that'll give you your lights. So I'm not applying any white paint actually on the landscape. I'm using the white of the gesso underneath for my whites. Um, and it, it's, I find the effect fascinating because it's, it's, it's like instant effect rather than sitting there laboring away, putting on layers of different, uh, different types of green. This, is, um, this will look like quite a detailed painting at the end and... Um, it, it isn't really, it's just texture. The texture gives the illusion of detail. So, uh, right. Now, here, I'm on the horizon line. Um, I'm, I'm putting in a few shapes, but I'm not, this is not the final horizon line. I never do that at this stage. What I do is just sort of tease, tease in some shapes to make it sort of interesting to the eye. And then I will paint the sky, whatever colour the sky is, as it hits the horizon, I'll apply that paint. Usually it's white, but uh, sometimes I stick a bit of cadmium orange in it for a sort of warm glow on the horizon. This is this is uh, actually white with a bit of royal blue here, and I'm going to put that on the sky. Once I'm happy with it, I'll start working back on the um, on the actual landscape itself. Sorry about my arm. I, I um, do have this problem where, actually, I I I I don't know any other way to do this because um, I've got to get in front of the canvas to see what I'm doing. But uh, occasionally I forget that the camera's there. I tend to get a bit immersed and uh, just go for it. But anyway, um, back to the sky here. I'm putting the color in. I'm not taking any great care about where I put it, so long as it's uh, as long as it's there. And um, once I've done that, I'll go back to the landscape and start pushing the two colours together. And when you do that, you get instant perspective. Because obviously, as the landscape recedes from you to the horizon, uh, you get dust particles in the air. It's called the Tinsdale effect. And uh, it's um, it's just uh, dust particles which usually reflect the colour blue. So obviously when you have uh, a pale blue mixed with the green of the landscape, as they come together, um, they, 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 they meld into this sort of like haze. If you don't do that uh, on a painting, it can look as though the landscape has been cut out and stuck down on a sky. Whereas really the sky and the landscape, you know, they, they, they come together on the horizon. Right, now, palette knife with a few high spots in the sky. I, I will probably do some paintings where I won't do much blending. Uh, I do blend the sky a little bit, but um, I quite like the sort of palette knife effect 
I'm not sure that it suits this particular painting, so uh, that's why I will be uh, smoothing and blending this white into the uh, background colour that I've put on the sky. Okay, at this point, um, a, a little word or two about brushes. I tend to use really large brushes um, because uh, if you use a small brush, particularly on this scale of painting, uh, providing you're not um, doing a very highly detailed painting, uh, you know, where you're going to paint every twig and um, every leaf on every tree, uh, I, although I have trouble understanding why anyone would want to do that, but each to their own. Uh, I use a big brush um, because it matches the scale of the picture and it gets the information over as quickly as possible. Anyway, um, so yeah, the bigger the brush, the less fussy your picture will be. Now, um, I've plastered on all this white paint and now I'm using, instead of a brush, I'm using kitchen paper again just to sort of uh, smear it a bit. There was a I think it was around about this point when I was painting it that I, I almost stopped and left the sky pretty well as you see it here, but uh, I managed to overcome that urge and um, try and improve on it. Just working along the horizon there, there's a tiny little bit of blue that I added. I think that that stays there right to the end of the picture, although it's, um, it's uh, sort of toned down considerably by the end. Okay, so up the top here, this is the, well, I'm going to state the obvious here, that's the light side. <laughs> that's the light side of the picture. Good thing about painting clouds is, um, f from, from my point of view, it, it doesn't, how do I explain it? Clouds are, are one of those things that... Um, you will never see the same cloud again, ever, anywhere. They're unique. Every cloud is different and has been since since Earth began. Since clouds were invented, every single cloud is different. No two are the same. You will get similar effects in skies, but each individual cloud has its own character. So it doesn't really matter what you do, as, as long as you, um, you know, you don't, well, if you're painting a realistic painting, you wouldn't paint rectangular and triangle-shaped clouds. Um, they're they're going to be pretty wild. And all the edges are going to be sort of, you know, varying degrees of fluffiness. So you can actually... Um, you don't have to paint clouds that have hard, bobbly edges to them. Uh, and a lot of beginners do this. They will paint, they'll paint clouds and they'll do these sort of bobbly, like... Uh, I don't know how to explain it really, like a giant cauliflower in the sky, except it's white with, with really neat hard edges. If you if you look at clouds, even the ones that look as though they've got these hard edges, if you take a photograph and zoom in, you'll see that the edges of those clouds are actually fluffy. They're, there's there's not a hard line. In fact, there, there's barely a hard line anywhere in nature. Everything's got a sort of fuzzy or slightly fluffy edge to it. So um, with clouds, if you feel that, um, you know, if you struggle with clouds, first of all, get it into your head. This is uh, something I tell all my students. If you think painting is difficult, then you, you are condoning yourself to a life of struggle. Painting is not difficult. The difficult thing is convincing yourself that painting is easy. We can all do it. We can all hold a brush. We can always we can all put paint on it, and we can we all we can all waggle it about on a surface and make make shapes and uh, um, you know colours and tonal changes, etc. Um, frame of mind is is very important in a painting. If you start a picture thinking, "My God, this is going to be difficult," it will be. You know, you have to um, you have to get this. Uh, you have to get into the frame of mind where you are totally convinced that it's easy and you can do it. Because you can. You, you can paint. You may want to argue that point with me, but everyone can paint. Now, I'm using a small brush here basically because 
I was rather naughty and I uh, ruined my big brush. I left it uh, too long and it's turned into a, um, well, it's turned into a chisel. Um, I've decided to soak it in uh, um, the liquid you put in your washing machine, you know, to clean clothes. Just neat in a, in a large plastic bucket and I just sort of, I'll let it sit there for a few days and it should be okay. But at the moment, uh, I've gone and, uh, you know, ruined it temporarily so i'm using a really small fluffy brush there just to sort of smooth out some of the brush strokes okay so this is the horizon over on the left hand side of the painting and even though i haven't really finished the uh, landscape it's still looking it's still got a nice bit of perspective in it a nice bit of distance Sorry about all the wobbling here. Uh, <laughs> hope it doesn't make you feel too seasick. Oh, this brush is interesting. Um, as some of you may know, I live in France. And these, these cheap brushes that I buy from uh, the hardware shop, um, they're really cheap. But this brush is specifically for painting behind radiators. It's got that angled bit, if I can get my hand down into the picture. So there you are. It's sort of got a, a bend in it, and it's actually quite good because you 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 get a good line of sight straight over the brush to the painting because it's got that kink. It keeps your hand down and out of the way so that uh, you can see clearly what's going on. Now, some people looking at that may think, oh, he's ruined that bit of cloud, but actually there's a reason why I'm doing that. Uh, it's a nice. It was a nice bit of cloud. It's got it's got a cloud-like look, but I just wanted to, I wanted to get uh, my old friend in there, drama. So the only way I'm going to do that is to add a bit of dark to it. And this is just Payne's Gray straight out the tube. Of course, it's mixing on the painting, so it's uh, calming it down a little bit. Side of the brush puts a lot of paint on. Tip of the brush mixes it. When you're blending something like this, it's um, it's quite easy to get um, entranced by the effect that you are painting and overdo it, which is why I will paint in one area just for a minute or so, and then I'll go and paint in another area of the painting so that one part doesn't get overdone. If you do too much smoothing out, you will end up with a very bland painting. This also demonstrates um, an, in, uh, an important factor in that as you paint, if you feel that you've made a mistake, rather than wipe it off or scrape it off, just push it around a little bit and turn the mistake into, uh, into something positive. So a certain American painter, teacher, Mr. Ross, um, <laughs> I think he, uh, I, I vaguely remember watching one of his videos years ago and he made a mistake and he said, I think he said, I'll turn that into a, a happy little tree. Well, I, I don't have happy little trees, I have happy little clouds. So if I do something on the cloud that looks wrong, rather than scrape it off, I'll work into it and turn it into a happy little cloud. This is cadmium orange that I'm uh, pushing around in the sky. When you use these, these very fluffy brushes, um, and this is an incredibly fluffy brush, if you're working on wet paint, it's very important that after a few dabs, you wipe the brush. Don't clean it with turpentine, you don't need to. Just wipe it on a bit of clean paper towel just to get the residue off and then you can go back onto the painting. And often any paint that's left on the brush actually will can look quite nice 
accidentally introduced into your picture. Right, so here, this is, I've decided now that I want a mountain. So uh, here we go with a mountain. Now, because the, because the sky is pretty well finished in that area, I can use the same colors that I use for the main part of the uh, greenery. This is, this is actually on the brush now. There's actually a mixture of sap green and um, Payne's grey. There's very little red ochre in it, and I'm doing that deliberately because um, the thing with colours is certain colours hit your retina before others. Red and black tend to hit the retina really quickly, fast. It's to do with colour wavelengths, I, I believe. It was, this was explained to me in college, but that's uh, way back in the last century. Um, so I, I'm not using red on the mountain. I'm leaning towards a bluey gray color. And as it mixes with the color in the sky, it automatically recedes into the background. So you get uh, a good feeling of distance. I think this, um, from my, looking back through my visual memory, uh, I have a feeling this is, uh, very similar to a place I went to in France when I went to the um, down to the Pyrenees. It's quite a few years ago now, but I, I was quite enthralled by the landscape. It was incredible. You, you've got a mixture of the great big mountains that are covered in greenery, and also um, what look like Alps, and um, quite a quite dynamic. Quite, quite dynamic. I spent a long time just walking around and observing. So there I'm picking up the sky colour now, pushing it down to the left to create my lights. So you can use a big brush, as you can see, and use the tip, or the corner, uh, for any sort of, well, I say detail, but the illusion of detail in the background. Because it's any any tree that far away basically is a blob anyway. So if it's a blob, paint a blob. At this stage, I'm just sort of I'm, I'm playing again. I tend to see painting as playing anyway, but this is um, just seeing how far I can push the horizon. The more I go up into that white in the sky, the more faded it's going to look. There are lots of uh, tricks you can use. Apart from the extreme distance there are things you can do in a painting in the foreground that will uh, give the feeling of perspective and I'll probably I'll probably cover that in another video um, but uh, th there are there are tricks you can uh, easily adopt uh, to get this effect instant line of trees. We get that a lot in France. You get these really delightful looking plantations of poplar trees. I'm sure they do it elsewhere as well, but uh, in France it seems to be uh, seems to be everywhere. At the end of the video, um, you'll see the, obviously you'll see the entire painting, but I've also um, Got a few close-ups as well so you can see the sort of textures I'm using um, and the image will be better than this I, I, at the moment I have to say this because my video camera um, is doing strange things um, and it's not very good on movies but still shots are excellent so you'll, you'll see the thing at the end and it'll become uh, much more clear Just a tad too contrasty. I 
and in a minute we're just going to go over to the right hand side of the painting because uh, I've got a gap to fill and you'll see how how I get the feeling of perspective in the foreground you, purely by using textures and also sort of like guiding lines lines that will lead you away this this will give you the impression of um, or the feeling that you can walk into the painting now that was interesting that I, that that wasn't intentional those those sort of lines that I just put in the paint there but that would look uh, quite like a vineyard in the distance I'm also considering doing a video on perspective um, more structural perspective because there are certain things that I know people struggle with like uh, I remember doing this at college uh, as part of the drawing lessons that we had explaining how you make supposing you painted a picture of a street scene I'm just rambling on while, uh, while I get on with this you paint a picture of a street scene and you've got a telegraph pole and then you've got the next one furthest away further away from you how do you then work out where the next telegraph pole goes or it could be a tree if the trees are planted in a sort of uh, grid and it's a very neat little trick and I'll show you that uh, on an, as I said on another video it's so simple but it's uh, mathematically correct so uh, I remember when they showed me how to do this I was absolutely gobsmacked I'm sure that um, particularly the Americans that may be watching this, uh, the word gobsmacked, it's a very English saying, and it means um, the gob is your, is your face or your mouth, and uh, smacked, gobsmacked, it's like, oh, that hit me in the face. That's what that means. So you can see there that that mound uh, by the side of the, there's a path down bottom left-hand corner where my hand is, that mound on the right has perspective and that's done by the way I've used the lines in the paint and the way they lead you up to the to the tree line at the top okay so a slightly more panoramic view of that area so if you if you paint a path or a road I mean this isn't necessarily a path this is actually just a sort of long flat field um, a hard edge just doesn't do it. It has to it has to blend into the landscape either side of it. And if you go out and look, uh, you'll see that um, you know that's what nature does. Everything is softly connected to everything else. And I think we're pretty well. Are we coming to the end? Oh no, I'm just scrolling through my video editor. Got a long way to go yet. My goodness. Okay. If you're still here, well done. Now I'm, I'm sort of just going around this. Um, unfortunately, my hand's in the way. I've got a I've got a piece of kitchen paper and I've sort of tweaked it into a little spike, so that I can pick up paint with it and deposit it back on the painting just for the odd little bush in the distance. And there, a little bit more, connecting the side of that mound to the bottom of the, where the um, the long well I suppose it could be a very wide path I, did, I didn't I didn't start out with uh, the idea that it would be a path it's just a bit of light light landscape if you look at my paintings <coughs> excuse me if you look at my paintings on Facebook uh, you'll see that I don't have any man-made objects in my paintings. I don't paint fields of cows, horses, sheep, deer. Uh, I don't paint farm buildings, and I don't paint little huts in the wilderness with snow on the roof, because, quite frankly, um, I don't want to. I prefer raw nature. I suppose this could be described as a vegan painting. Now, talking uh, very briefly uh, about perspective, uh, when my hand, um, when I move my hand out the way, 
you notice on the bottom left there's a long streak of light uh, leading up into the, that clump of trees. I'm sure I'll get out of the way in a minute. Okay, so there we are. I'm dragging the paint down to the bottom there with a few light bits. And that, that draws the eye in. The eye cannot resist following that line. Oh, this is something else I do. Uh, a little bit of whipping on the, um, on the paint uh, with a bit of paper. Uh, particularly if the foreground comes right up to the viewer. If you do that in the foreground, you get an amazing effect of lots and lots of strands of grass. And it's completely haphazard. And it, it, it looks as though you've spent ages painting every blade of grass, which I will never do. Uh, really nice effect. And it, if you do want to paint every blade of grass, this is actually quite a good way to start it by doing this whipping effect. Let it dry and you will you, all your stems of the weeds and the grass and the foliage will actually be on the painting. And you can use those and paint all, over them with a light uh, colour with a thin brush. Um, and come up with the most amazing, totally random shapes. Often when people paint grass, they do everything, first of all, too, the blades of grass too thick and too regular. Grass doesn't do that. Now, the edge, the edge of this tree that I'm putting down in the bottom here, um, obviously using the corner of the brush and, and keeping it as random as possible with the odd light spot from the land behind showing through. Okay, now, back to the mountain. You notice the slight rise in the um, top of the mountain on the extreme right. Now, this is something you'll see in my paintings. It's quite a neat little trick that was uh, explained to me when I was a student. It's called, uh, well, the teacher that uh, taught me this um, he's actually still around. He's, uh, his name was Trevor Kemp. Um, he's a Sussex-based uh, artist. I think he's still around anyway. Um, it's called a stopper, so that when the eye is looking along that ridge of mountains, when it gets to the edge, instead of it just tailing off, and the eye loves to follow a line, uh, it's got that little raise, little rise there just to sort of stop you. And the bush down in the bottom right corner, uh, I will usually do that in my paintings because that is also another stopper. That stops the eye. It's something uh, to just hold the attention of the viewer just to keep them in the picture. It's a bit like um, finding ways to trap the viewer in your picture so that they just really can't, not that they don't want to leave, but <laughs> they can't. Okay, so this is just a little bit of texture on the side of the hill. And it's... Um, it, it's fascinating uh, to me because um, I don't actually think as I'm painting it, it just sort of happens, so I can't explain that. I think it's if you want to do that sort of thing, you just have to sort of just let the brush wander. There's a saying that uh, the, longer you, the, the more you paint, the better you get at it. But also the longer you paint and the older you get, and as long as you keep painting, the more the paint knows where to go. I know that's not strictly true, it's just a saying. So back into it with the tissue, just to make a few light areas. 
There's that shoulder again. One thing about this uh, this effect, uh, this technique rather, using a kitchen paper towel thing, is um, that, uh, and I said it earlier on, you know, don't don't be afraid of making a mistake. Uh, everyone makes mistakes. I make mistakes. Um, the trick is learning how to turn that mistake um, into something that's worth keeping. So here we are again over on the left hand side, a little bit more work on the horizon. What I, what I don't really want uh, are too many uh, high contrasty dark spots on the horizon. Maybe, you know, the odd little one or two, but mostly I want it to just fade away. I, I certainly recommend this style to people who are just starting painting. One of the things that I've found that puts people off um, is they'll get a photograph and they'll sit down and look at the photograph and think, right, I'll paint that. And then they, they draw it out in pencil. And uh, which, if it's something highly technical, fine, because you, you might need pencil marks as a guide. But if it's, um, if it's something like this, which is just all organic shapes, um, I, I, I don't see the use uh, of, or the, the reason to use a pencil, because you can just paint over it anyway. Um, you know, just um, if you're a big, complete beginner, I recommend you don't have a photograph to copy. Maybe look at something on the internet you know, get a feeling for what you want. Then, then, um, close, don't keep it on your screen. Shut, shut it off your screen, and then try painting from memory, uh, and just, just, um, you know, have fun with it. Just push the paint around because you're not trying. You're not trying to make it look like anything that exists. What you're doing is, uh, you notice I've sped up here. This is not the result of. Um, coffee this is me just trying to speed forward a little bit um yeah just just paint wild like this so that um um you know you, it, nobody will ever know if you make a mistake in fact it, it, you won't even know if you've made a mistake if you do it this way it's uh, you know just um it's freestyle Now this is actually the day after, um, just after that bit I just uh, that you just saw where it was speeded up. This is this is what I'd done on this today because I felt that the sky was just looking too uniform, so I I let rip with uh, um, a few more darks and a few more reds in the sky, and uh, just sort of went crazy with the white paint a little bit just to sort of spark it up a bit. So here we go, just tickling away on the sky. As usual with skies. Oh, there's a little trick I used to um, I used to use. I still do, actually, and I, I often tell my students to do this. If you're worried about painting a sky that is too repetitive, then do what I do, and that is to start painting. And then for about 10 seconds every few minutes, just um, close your eyes. Just let your hand go and do what it wants to do on the painting. And then open your eyes and hopefully you will have made shapes that are totally unplanned. And it, it, uh, it helped me a great deal, actually, way back uh, when I first started painting. It just, just gave me that extra bit of uh, unpredictable randomness that uh, you can get. So there we are using our hands. And... Um, don't forget to wipe your hands afterwards. So here we are, we're coming to the end of the video. Do I hear a sigh of relief from many people? 
Anyway, if you have lasted this long, I think you deserve some kind of medal. And uh, so let me know who you are, if you did last to the end, and I'll sort out a medal for you. Final bit of blending on the uh, borderline between the light sky and the dark sky. And a few more little highlights. Thank you for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've learned something. Don't forget, you can paint. Here's the final picture and some close-ups. <laughs>